You were about to enter Chuck versus the podcast, the place for people who love Chuck and the people who work on Chuck. The only show that takes you behind the scenes with the stars. Yvonne Strahovski. Zachary Levi. Joshua Gomez. Ryan McPartland. Adam Balba. Sarah Lancaster. Interactive interviews. Julia Wing. Phil Clemmer. All the cast. Dixon High. Tony Hale. Scott Krinsky. Marcus for Lawrence. Anita Figueresi. Fun hosts. This is Mel. This is Liz. Now you can see how wacko we are. The writers. Ali Adler. Scott Rosenbaum. Zev Barrow. The editors. Matt Barber. Jeff Granville. Kevin Mock. Contests. We are giving away a Chuck press kit. The directors. Jason Enzo. Norman Buckley. The guest stars. Steve Austin. Kristen Griff. The music. This is Tim Jones. Guest hosts. I'm Kaylee from Toronto. Conventions. Lights come up and here comes Jester out on stage. Set visits. This is the guy right here. And much more. Are you ready? This is Gray. This is Mel. This is Liz. And we want to welcome you to Chuck vs. the Podcast, episode 73 for Friday, November 19th, 2010. We have a new episode of Chuck to discuss and very excitingly an interview that Mel had with its director, Robert Duncan McNeil. But first, the news. All right, let's hit the ratings first for Chuck vs. the Fear of Death, which aired on Monday. They're in, and it's a mixed bag. The mm. Fast Overnights were showing that approximately 5.55 million viewers tuned in to see Summer Glau face off with Jester, Jeffster, and uh, Rob Riggle try to scare the Intersect back into operation. That was the most total viewers since the season premiere. However, it did adjust down a little bit, so it's I think it's pretty much on par with the higher rated episodes of the season. Um, it scored a 1.8 in that 18 to 49 ab- advertiser demo, which is the lowest demo number so far this season, but it still was the highest rated show for NBC that night. Hmm. So, thanks. Um, you know, there's a lot of theories about it. My personal theory was that a bunch of Czech viewers turned 50 between during that two week hiatus. <laughs> so they no longer count. <laughs> That's what I think. Uh-huh. Um, I know that. Where I live, uh, eastern Kansas, it was preempted for KU basketball, whatever. And uh, then, you know, there was also, as I said, the two-week hiatus probably had a bigger impact on it. Um, that Lauer Bush interview that we got preempted for last week, it had more overall viewers, but it also had a 1.8 in the demo. So it is what it is. Yep, it is. Yeah. Well, and, you know... Um, as we're going to discover in our next news item, NBC is showing lots of confidence in Chuck, so not to worry. Um, on that note, uh, NBC is moving things around in its 2011 schedule as they kick off the midseason. And uh, very, very interestingly, Chuck is the only one that stays. Although all three current Monday shows were picked up through the rest of the season, Mondays will look a little different. And actually, I'm, I'm really excited about the difference, even though I, I'm not so excited that the event is uh, is on a long hiatus but i am excited that summer glau's new show the cape is going to be right after chuck so chuck is going to anchor a new lineup that has the new series uh the cape about a disgraced cop who tries to clear his name via some superhero-esque techniques and it premieres sunday january 9th with back-to-back episodes and then moves to 9 8 central so right after chuck on mondays beginning january 17th uh, that's going to be a, a real dynamic duo, I think. Um, the event will be on hiatus, as I mentioned, until February 28th, um, at which point apparently NBC plans a massive relaunch uh, in its original time slot. Um, I'm, I'm eager to find out what that means. So I, I've heard massive relaunch, and then I've heard some other things that they're just going to air a clip show and then get right back to business. Not sure. Um, but I, I'm hoping they do put some more uh, marketing muscle behind that show because I think it's a great show. But meanwhile, um, Chase will move to Wednesdays and the new series Harry's Law will try the 10 9 central slot on Mondays. Uh, what What is Harry's Law about? Do you guys know? It's the one with um, Kathy Bates. Mm-hmm. And who's that by? Uh, isn't that the new? Um, oh, gosh, I'm totally blanking on his name. He did Boston Legal and Ally McBeal. Mm-hmm. You know, that guy. Oh, that guy. Yes, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had like eight shows on in the 90s. Uh-huh. And they were all about legal, uh, Boston Public. 
Uh, you know, I, I never That's watch those shows. Right. So I've we'll just call him that guy for now. And three minutes after the podcast comes out, somebody will tweet <laughs> the answer. Or we'll think of it then. Yeah. Yeah. Liz is cold as contagious. Uh-huh. We're all- <laughs> I can't think at all. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, that is good news, though. I, I for one, am really excited about the cape. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. following Chuck, I'm just I'm planting it on Monday nights. Yeah. Sending yeah. the kids out. James Frain as the big bad. James yeah. Frain. Oh. Hello. Yeah, Liz and I are fans. Yeah. Especially since we met him and he's such a nice guy and he drinks good coffee. Yes. And <laughs> that's a reason to check out a show. <laughs> well, he and Liz bonded <laughs> over coffee uh-huh. at, at Comic-Con. Yeah, it's pretty cute. There's power in the bean. Uh-huh. <laughs> there is power in the bean. <laughs> Well, moving along, Star Fury has announced that Chuck stars Ryan McPartland and Vic Sahai, plus guest star Summer Glau, are all confirmed for the T3 Rise of the Nerds convention in mm. London. It uh, takes place June 24th through 26th. Can we get our tickets, Mel? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Thomas Decker from Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, will also be, is also confirmed to attend. You can visit T3 website and um, get more details there. Plan your trip. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have to just interject a, a little uh, really random fact. Uh, I, I love these random things. But ter- uh, regarding Terminator, Sarah Connor Chronicles, the producer of the Terminator um, uh, Aliens and, and a whole bunch of other uh, movies and as well, the Terminator, Sarah Connor Chronicles, and the new zombie thing. Um, Gail Ann Hurd just followed me randomly on Twitter uh, the other day, and uh, she will be an upcoming interview on the TV Writer Podcast. Cool. cool. Mm-hmm. Neat. Yeah, awesome. Well, we had our own little crossover this week when Summer Glau guest starred on Chuck. And so for the Friday Five, we did Chuck versus the Crossover. And I chose my five picks for which shows I'd like to see Chuck cross over with. And I limited myself to shows that were currently on the air. So there were a lot of suggestions for other shows that um, I, I would have liked to have done. But I had my own little criteria that I was following. But uh-huh. my, picks, my picks were White Collar and uh, The Return of Bryce, Glee, Psych, Grey's Anatomy, because I thought uh, Devin could show McSteamy and McDreamy how to be McAwesome. <laughs> and Ellie could, you know, show him what a stable relationship looks like. And, of course, Castle. Mm-hmm. Of course. Of course. So, in the comments, there were a lot of really good suggestions. A lot of votes for Burn Notice, um, Covert Affairs. That would be a good one. Yeah. Ooh. Um, yeah. So, yes. yeah, there were a lot. There were, so, you know, there were some Buffy Angel requests, you know, suggestions. But they're off the air, folks. Doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Bones. Some people suggested Bones. Ooh, yeah. that would be that good. Working. Yeah. Yeah. That could be cool. Well, that actually uh, brings up something. Um, a, a number of weeks ago, I actually had some interviews on the TV Writer Podcast with Eureka and <laughs> uh, Warehouse 13 writers, and they had a, a crossover, and both of those are in the NBC Universal umbrella of, uh, of shows. And so I just uh, realized that as I was talking with them, that both of those shows really got an uptick in the ratings from crossovers. So I sent an email to Chris Fedak uh, mentioning that, uh, you know, ratings are always an issue with Chuck, so why why don't they consider a crossover? And he actually got back to me and said, sounds interesting. Uh, why don't you give me some ideas? So I, I tweeted, and, and we took up a vote a few weeks ago, and I sent all of the results to Chris Fedak. And so, and I actually sent, he wanted to hear your comments as well. So I sent a bunch of comments to him and he is taking it seriously. So, uh, yeah, I, and you might be curious what the results were of the vote that we put out on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were uh, probably not surprisingly 11 votes, the highest number of votes for white collar. Um, there were eight votes for burn notice. There were six votes for covert affairs. And a lot of people commented that it's interesting that uh, that Annie Walker, the main character, has uh-huh. got the same uh, last name. Well, even though it's a it's a false last name for for Sarah, but that that was interesting. Um, but a lot of people suggested that Augie in any capacity would be great on Chuck. 
Yes, he would. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, mm. hey, how about Greta? I mean, that that would be oh, yeah. a really easy one. Uh, there were six votes for Psych. Uh, there were five for Eureka. And then trailing were Community, Undercovers, and even one vote for Veronica Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> yeah. But, uh, but Chris Fedak said he's taking it seriously. So... Um, cool. Who knows? Might, yeah. might how, just happen. How did I miss that? I completely missed that. Uh, when did I, you do that? I, I don't know if you were away somewhere at the time. Oh. Um, but I see uh, how it is. I leave and you do the cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, the really interesting thing is that uh, a lot of those shows are um, USA shows, which are owned by NBC Universal. Mm -hmm. And so the, it's... It, and NBC Universal are the ones that did the crossover with Warehouse 13 and Eureka. So they're yeah. very open to the possibilities. They see that there's an increase in ratings that can happen. So could happen. How much fun would that be? Oh, yeah. Now I don't know who I want it to be. I think I'm still going to vote for White Collar just because I think it would be so cool to watch them integrate Matt Bomer's character somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Some interesting challenges, though, in terms of uh, like some some people have said maybe he was the um long lost twin or something <laughs> yeah well my theory was that he was that bryce was using his contacts as a cia agent to steal art and you know because that pension's not going to keep him in the style to which he's accustomed mm -hmm. and then he got busted by the fbi and the cia burned him mm -hmm. that's my see so, you know i see the 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 not twin so much as sister thing coming into play with covert affairs yeah. Mm -hmm. Being that the girls have the same last name there. Mm -hmm. uh, be fun. Yeah. Could be interesting. Anyway, moving on to the next news item. Um, we are very, very excited that the 2010 Podcast Awards are coming up. And we're asking for your help. And that help is specifically at this point in the process to uh, please nominate us. And the nominations can be a little tricky. There's a whole pile of different categories and you can only do a nomination once. So you can choose a whole bunch of other podcasts in, in different categories. And what we're asking is if you would please specifically nominate our po podcast in the best produced category and the best video podcast category. Um, and the Earl is... Uh, chuckpodcast.com in case you haven't been there in a while and it's chuck versus the podcast is the name of the podcast uh, ballots are due by 11 59 p.m on november 21st so we got to get those in soon and we really appreciate your help in this yes yeah, okay. we've got the pretty face the hotness in mel and the <laughs> awesome talent in gray so what's not to love yeah <laughs> yeah very much so um so that's it for the news, and we're going to roll with Mel's interview with Robert Duncan McNeil, who was the director of this week's episode of Chuck. Enjoy. Okay, this is Mel with ChuckTV.net and Chuck versus the Podcast. I'm on the phone with Robert Duncan McNeil, who directed episode 408, Chuck versus the Fear of Death. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> I love our Chuck versus title. They're just, I don't know. You should hear some of the ones we throw out. They're pretty uh, raunchy, actually. But... <laughs> I, I think maybe you should do uh, extras on the DVD with some of the rejected titles. Yeah, rejected titles. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll tell you that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So we've had a few questions, um, some of the technical stuff that you yeah. did with this episode, starting with that really phenomenal scene between Yvonne and Zach, where Sarah tells Chuck, it kind of blurts out, you're not a spy. Yeah, very. And, uh, yeah, hard. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously that is uh, the moment that that's um, emotionally a real high point or low point, however you look at it for this episode, but also drives the next episode in, in lots of ways. So that's, that's and, and sidebar, that's been a great thing about being on this show for the last four years as a producing director is that is I'm a, really able to kind of look at the big picture and, and moments like that and how that drives 
multiple episodes and, and knowing where to look for those and carve them out, you know, um, when I'm directing. And so, um, yeah, that was a really important moment that we nailed it. And I think Yvonne and everybody did a great job. They really did. It was so emotional. And I think I was sitting there and I was like, oh, my gosh, what did you just do? Yeah. <laughs> but were they in the same room when they were filming that? Because, of course, in the scene, she's in Castle and he's away in Switzerland and, and they're talking via um, satellite link. Yeah. Yeah. What we did was we um, you know, did our usual um, Beckman on the big screen. And the way we do that, um, for those that don't know, the way we normally do that is when the, the crew is hanging out in the in the briefing room, Beckman's on the big screen, but she's really just in a small set, you know, 50, 20 feet away uh, on a video camera that's playing back live into that room. So they're able to interact with each other, and that's something we do all the time. So what we decided to do for that scene was um, actually create a third set which was a small portion of the location that, that we shot the rest of the, the scenes at with uh, Rob Riggle and Zach Levi. Mm -hmm. We just put one small wall and another video camera. So that then we had three sets lit at one time, two of them on video only, and, of course, the castle with um, Casey and Sarah. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and they were able to interact with each other. So they weren't in the same room, but they were... Uh, looking at each other like you would on a, you know, we kind of create a, a, a version of a eye chat. We have a little monitor there and and a video camera that's filming them live. Mm -hmm. um, so they're able to kind of interact with each other in a way that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was real time. Yeah, so it was real time. Another thing that, um, you know, just uh, having directed that one and, and gone through all the steps, including editing, one thing that I think that was a key to that scene working as well as it did was, um, and sometimes it's, it's easy to overlook for people, but it was the reactions of, of the other actors, not just Zach and Yvonne's performances, which were great, mm -hmm. but it was the reactions of people that were aware of the tension and being able to cut to Adam Baldwin reacting numerous times which helped build the tension, to be able to cut to the two shot and see Rob Riggle reacting in a way that everybody, we were all on the same page. And, and that was that was as important, the reactions um, were, were as, as important as uh, the Chuck and Sarah performances, to be honest. It all, it all worked together very well. Do you feel like the actors that weren't directly involved in the scene but were there, were they kind of stand-ins for the audience? Yeah, I think so in a way. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's it's uh we wanted it to play as clear to those characters in the room as as you would want it to play to the audience. So yeah, I think you know, kind of watching this tennis match go out of control between Chuck and Sarah and, and go that that argument kind of go off the rails in such an emotional way and mm -hmm. uh in a public way was was really I think they they played it well. That was something very different for us as, when it comes to Sarah is watching her lose control, like you said, in a public way yeah. with, with not just with Chuck, but with other witnesses. What's going on with her? What's what's moving her to do that? <laughs> well, I think that, um, you know, this this whole season, as, as you know very well, has, has been driven a lot by the Chuck Sarah relationship. That has the whole series, really. But this season in particular, driven specifically with their relationship and taking that next big step. Are they going to get engaged? Are they going to get married? When is he going to propose? How's that? There's a lot of pressure. Are we ready? Um, you know, the emotional stakes as they grow up and become closer, uh, the emotional stakes are raised even more. And so um, I think that's where this is coming from, is that, is that she's really kind of committed and, and risked herself emotionally in a way that's very, um, you know, rare for her. She's taken some big risks emotionally with Chuck, and I think she's worried, and she feels like, um, you know, he uh, he needs her, and, and she feels mm -hmm. responsible for him in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think that that's driving it, and I think that the emotional stakes of that relationship are getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, they seem to be as she becomes more engaged and more committed because he's yeah. kind of been there from the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how does her 
um, her outburst, how is that affecting him? Well, I think that, you know, that the, that the fundamental conflict that those two have is, you know, is this faith in do you, do you love me because of what I do or do you love me because of me? Mm-hmm. And that's gonna, kind of the essential dilemma of that relationship, you know. Right. Chuck feels like, does Sarah love me because I'm, because of the intersect or does she love me because I'm just regular old Chuck? And can he trust that? And can he even believe her? Even if she reassures him, can he really believe it? And that's the moment where he feels like, holy crap, you know, she doesn't believe in me. She doesn't believe in me as who I am. She thinks I need the intersect. And it's, it's a moment that's going to drive all the next couple episodes in a big way. So, um, Are they going to come to some sort of a conclusion? Are we going to ever see him able to trust that she loves him for him? Yeah, I, I think we, yes, absolutely we will. But along the way, they're going to have to kind of, you know, they make their mistakes and mm-hmm. things and, and, and react in flawed ways, just like regular flawed people and normal people and, uh, mm-hmm. and emotion, regular emotional people. So, yeah. so yeah, that, that moment right there kind of drives a lot. It drives Chuck to take risks to prove that he, is worthy of her love in ways that he probably doesn't need to prove and is doing it for the wrong reasons. And I think it drives her to kind of break some rules in the next couple episodes that probably put her in, in danger more than she needs to be. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, it's just a lot of our stories are coming out of that emotional setup. Mm-hmm. Which I, love. I love when the shows are funny and you laugh a lot and there's some cool excitement, but in the end it's all kind of got a foundation of some really good emotions to it. Yeah, sure. And I'm looking forward to seeing, especially from Sarah's side, watching her work through this. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to that gondola scene. I know you were excited about us seeing that. You posted on Facebook (laughs) about that. (laughs) Um, Tell us a little bit about what went into making that scene. And holy crap, Richard Chamberlain. I mean, Richard Chamberlain, I know. It was awesome. Um, (laughs) He was great. Yeah, um, the gondola scene, you know, when they came up with this idea, uh, it sounded crazy, but what doesn't sound crazy on our show when we first start talking about it? Um, yeah, um, they came up with this idea of this mission at the top of the Alps and a gondola and a gondola fight where Chuck has to kind of fight his way out and without the intersect, try to force himself to slash. So, so all the kind of story elements were there, but we were trying to figure out technically how to do it. And then, there were a lot of things to think about. One is, do we build a, a fake gondola? Is that the easiest way to do it? Um, our line producer, um, Paul Marks, actually found a gondola from Palm Springs. It was an old gondola used down in Palm Springs, California, to take you up to the top of the mountains, out of the desert to the top of the mountain. Oh. But it was just sitting in mothballs, and so we trucked it down from Palm Springs and refurbished it and made it look... Uh, like what you saw on the show. So we actually put that up on kind of a, a giant dolly so we could turn it around and put it in front of a green screen. And then, then the next step was figuring out, all right, what are the backgrounds going to be? Because there's so many scenes in this episode in this gondola going up, going down, that it really needs to be specific. We can't just get stock footage, you know, off of stockfootage.com or something. <laughs> to put back here, it's very, we need something real specific. So our visual effects, Supervisor Dan Curry actually contacted uh, a visual effects uh, person in New Zealand that had worked on Lord of the Rings because it's uh-huh. winter in New Zealand right now. Uh-huh. And uh, we organized and arranged for him to go out and shoot all the background plates in New Zealand now because mm-hmm. it's snowing there. You know, it's winter there. Uh, or it's the end of winter, I guess. Um, anyway. So he went up to their ski resorts and took the lifts up and down and filmed all those plates in New Zealand, um, filmed the driving shots for us so that it would match when Sarah's driving up to the, try to get to the, to the gondola to meet him. And, uh, so it was a real team effort. Yeah. Everybody kind of, uh, came through with some great solutions. Uh, the Palm Springs gondola, the background plates from New Zealand. And we were able to create a great sequence though, on a green screen stage that, that had a lot of authenticity to it. You know, if you mm-hmm. look back at the the James Bond gondola, <laughs> and 
you look at you know some of the compromises they had to make back in the day to, to, to film a similar kind of scene. Um, I think ours is really exciting, and, and for what for what you know our limitations are, it was just really incredible. It's it visually stunning, and you know looks the, the background plates look great, the New Zealand work looked great, Dan Curry stuff. It was all it was all just uh, it came off great. Rob mm -hmm. Riggle, I was so excited to have in the episode. He's somebody that has always made me laugh from his stand-up comedy and Daily Show days to the movies he's making. Uh, I love Rob Riggle and. Yeah. Uh, he was totally perfect for our show, just really. He's a very different type of agent, but I think he worked. I, I kind of liked his gung-ho, yeah. flippant, let's put you in danger yeah, attitude. Exactly. Yeah, yeah he was, he was uh, for this episode and for the story and totally what we needed for Chuck to go through, that, that real kind of macho testosterone, swashbuckling, mm -hmm. you know, fearless quality, you know, um, reckless quality um yes. he was great he yeah. was really great so. well it's we've got several easter eggs in this episode of course we have a star trek reference <laughs> i assume that was in your honor i think it was yes i do i, I you know i never uh found out for sure but yeah. uh, i hope so yeah we also got our adam baldwin summer glow scene for the firefly fans yes that was a chris feedback pitch at the last minute the uh you know this is the best team i've ever worked with Kind of shout out. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. I'm a Firefly fan, fan, so I appreciated that. Oh, cool. Yeah, and now I find out we had Lord of the Rings represented too. Yeah, yeah. My favorite movies of all time. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty and cool. It, we had some really exciting people, you know, involved yeah. in this one. Now, a German fan named Joshua emailed us today and said um, that he just watched the episode. We're not going to say how. He says it was yeah. a great episode and not just because of Summer Glau. He says, since I'm German, I especially liked that the cable car cabin in Switzerland said Bosvik Vergut, I think that's how it's pronounced, which means bad guys mountain shelter. Yes, it did. <laughs> Yeah, we had, <laughs> yeah we had that bad guys basically bad guys lair translated into uh, Swiss. Yeah, that's how it came out. <laughs> that's amazing. I love it. I love yeah. it. Well, are you directing anything else soon that we're going to see? Um, I, I don't direct on our show again until episode twenty and twenty four. The finale. Oh my. Wow. So I've got a, yeah, I've got a break. I mean, you know, I'm here all the time, kind of um, helping our our guest directors and um, mm -hmm. everyone kind of make sure things go smoothly. And so yeah. I'm around and producing all the time. And, yeah. But uh, I love, I love directing. I, I'd like to be directing more, but we've got so many great people um, mm -hmm. to choose from that it's good to work them all in. Yeah. It's nice that you have such a good stable of directors to come in that, that know the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And Oh man. And the fans are just thrilled to bits with these new writers. I have to tell you. Oh, good. Yeah, they're a great group. Really, really talented. Yeah, it's been practically seamless. So that's that's great. How how are you guys handling the eleven episode extension? Uh, you know, a little <laughs> freaked out, but I think uh, I think we'll make it. Yeah, it's it's, it's pretty. Uh, it's a lot. Twenty four. I remember, you know, back in the UPN days when I was an actor, I'd doing twenty six episodes of Star Trek Voyager a year. Mm -hmm. Six was. And I was just acting on the show at the time, so, but it was a real, you know, it doesn't sound like much of a difference, just a few more episodes, but on a show of this scale with the intensity of the hours and the energy and the creativity and producing and, and all the, all the elements, uh, it's a lot. Yeah. So it's gonna, you know, people are excited, but it's definitely, uh, um, it's definitely on the production side, it's a, it's a lot to produce 24 episodes of this show. On yeah. the creative side, though, it's really exciting because there's so many great, you know, emotional stories to tell and great character stories to tell, and so it just gives us a bigger palette to play with and more time to uh, to explore all these all these great characters. Yeah, and of course the fans are excited because if we had our way, it'd be on 52 <laughs> weeks out of the year. Yeah, that's, yeah. That'd be awesome. No vacation. I'd die. I'd be dead, but it'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, and any chance that we're going to see you in front of the camera and a you know a little cameo? I don't know about that. Oh, come on, man. I don't know. It have to. 
I told him they should do one where it's like a, you know, like a sci-fi convention. I'd get all the, I'll get all the, you know, Star Trek people and Masters of the Universe people and, <laughs> uh, you know, everybody I know from that whole world. I'd get them, you know, to show up and do cameos. I'd do that. That'd be funny. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we we got to do like a Comic Con nod. We got to right. Go to, we got to go to a sci fi convention of some sort. You know, we got to. I agree. Yeah, we'll work on that. All right, cool. I'll hold you to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, All well, right. Thanks a bunch for taking the time to chat with us. About, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're looking forward to what's coming up, and then of course we've got a long hiatus, and then more Chuck. I know. Very exciting. Well, cool. Well, thanks for checking in, and I will talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Robbie. Okay. Bye. Bye. And we're back. So, wow, um, that that was really cool. I understand that there was a, a, a that this was kind of a surprise that this was going to happen. It was. I mean, he's always been very quick to respond when I asked him a question. And, uh, you know, he said, you got my number. Give me a call anytime you need something, which, you know, when they say that, <laughs> like, whatever, <laughs> not going to call you. But um, we had, as I mentioned to him, we had a fan. It was uh, Kathy Toy emailed this morning or on Tuesday morning and said um, that she was curious about the technical aspects of shooting that scene between Chuck and Sarah. And she wondered if I could write an article from an insider's perspective on how it was done. And then someone else emailed about the gondola scene and, or mentioned it on, in the forums. And, um, and then we had this awesome, that awesome email from our German Chuck fan mm -hmm. to tie in with that, which you heard Robbie liked that, that catch. And, uh, so I, e I, I emailed him and said, Hey, you know, would you be interested in just chatting with me a little bit, either as an actual interview or maybe just to help me with this article? And uh, then he called me on his lunch break and said, hey, let's have a talk. Let's interview. So there you go. That's, very, very that's, cool. That's the Chuck folks for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Happy to reach out to the fans and share their their knowledge. So yeah. that was really cool. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I... I literally had about three minutes. I was like, oh, let me call you back so I can record this. And <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that sounds like um, Yvonne Strahovski, uh, that interview yeah. I had with her last year. It It was like... I was thinking we're going to have an interview some other time, and I get an email saying I'm I can be ready in five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it is a scramble because there's a, like there's things you need to put in place, like you got to get the microphone and the software and all the, all that ready, and yeah, and questions would be good too. Yeah. So, <laughs> although you know, I think this actually went better, but for the fact that I was just like you know top of, off the top of my head, uh -huh. you know, I had the base questions from the fans, and then. As he was chatting, you just do that organic, well, what about, and how about? <laughs> Sometimes those generate really good interviews. Sometimes yeah. they generate crickets, but mm -hmm. it's, this time it worked. Yeah. So thanks, Depends Robbie. Depends you're talking to. Yeah, yeah. So many thanks to him. Really mm -hmm. appreciate him uh, walking us through some of those things and sharing a few anecdotes from the set. Very, very cool. Very cool. And so that's a good segue into talking about the episode. Um, Chuck versus the fear of death, which I I thought was a great episode. Um, I understand that there were some fans that had uh, issues with it. What, what did you guys think? Well, you know, a lot of the fans didn't like Rye, mm -hmm. but I thought he was cool. Yeah. You know, he I was... I liked him. Yeah, I liked him. He was fun. Um, maybe if, if... Maybe what people didn't like was that he was too focused he had i mean but he was sent there to do a job mm -hmm. he was sent there to to jump start you know chuck somehow the intersect in chuck to to get it going somehow and he he had to do whatever it took that's what his job was so maybe he was you know uber focused on that but but i thought he was uh pretty creative in some of the stuff he did and and i thought it was fun and I kind of got the feeling that he was enjoying himself just watching Chuck react to the different things. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he's a very different kind of, uh, well, just person mm -hmm. um, that, that we've had, you know, especially in the good guys. I could see the fans maybe being more willing to accept him in that role as a villain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because he had that kind of flippant thing going on. 
Yeah. But with a little bit of authority. So I get where some of that is coming from, but I liked that he was thinking outside the box Mm -hmm. and challenging Chuck in ways that he hasn't been challenged before. I understand why Sarah was concerned. I would be too if you had some guy going, yeah, let's put you in danger. (laughs) Woohoo! Hope it works. Fingers crossed. You know, I'd be freaking out a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, and I thought I thought it was a lot of the stuff was just hilarious. Um, like the uh, the ninjas uh, reminded me a bit of the Pink Panther, how they, they were throwing, like trying to surprise with the uh, um, with the ninja attacks. Um, yeah, but uh, maybe uh, maybe this would be a good place to read uh, that email that we got from Matt. Sure. Um, we got an email from Matt uh, regarding the episode. Uh, that aired and he said i've noticed a lot of folks on comments pages blogs and twitter voicing concerns about this episode's apparent retread of the old issue of whether chuck is capable of being a spy without the intersect personally i think that one key thing to remember is that without the skills abilities and information provided by the intersect chuck would have to be retrained in all those areas by conventional means which would take a lot of time and money Furthermore, since Chuck has the only intersect currently operating, it makes sense that the CIA and NSA would want to take the time to figure out what's wrong with the intersect and try to fix it. During that time, it would be only logical to sideline Chuck so that he doesn't get hurt or killed, resulting in a loss of the intersect. And regarding the somewhat shocking moment when Sarah tells Chuck that he's not a spy, for me, that moment touched on the idea that while previous uh, insecurities Sarah had about Chuck becoming a spy that it would destroy his moral compass, have been resolved. There's a different worry that's now being addressed. The way I figure it, Sarah's statement that Chuck wasn't a spy without the intersect, at least not at that point, came from doubts as to his emotional and psychological ability to handle the job. Uh, or not came from those not. things, yeah. But purely from the fact that without the obviously powerful tool, tool the intersect provides, he is less well-equipped to take on the threats and challenges of being a spy and is more vulnerable. In other words, in season three, Sarah was scared of losing Chuck in the moral psychological sense. And right now in season four, she's scared of losing him in a literal physical sense. And, you know, I totally agree. I mean, I think he he's even more important to her now than he was before. And Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that he has no protection. I mean, it's very different than and she expressed concern like in um, in Chuck versus uh, you know the airplane one um first class uh-huh. uh, she she was scared about him going into a situation like that even when he had the intersect right so this is not a new fear for her yeah it was just incredibly heightened because he did not have the intersect and somebody on the forums brought up well wasn't that what he was in training for in the season in season 3 in the premiere mhm uh, and no he was being trained to use the intersect mhm he wasn't being trained in spy skills, really. He was being trained how to control the intersect and use it, mm-hmm. which is completely different because if he's if that tool is taken away, what does he have to fall back on? He yeah. does. He's got a lot. He does. Before you all start yelling, he does have his <laughs> brains, yeah. and he's shown more than once that he can use his, his mind to great effect, and he can come up with solutions that the trained spies can't. But the fact of the matter is that without any sort of training, any sort of spy training other than the intersect, he is incredibly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was a major moment for that. You know, when Sarah blurted that out, you're not a spy and she didn't have time to really explain the context of that, what she meant. But no, he's not a spy. He does not have the proper training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at first, I don't. I, do you think Chuck? I don't think Chuck realized that that's what she was saying at first. I think he realized it later. When Maybe. trouble, when real trouble came, and and I don't know. I, it just seemed to me that at first, when she blurted that out, the look on his face was, "Wow, huh. mm-hmm. thanks, girlfriend." You know. And we we did get a few instances of him bringing his own specific skill set without the intersect to that mission. Um, you know, when he was able to, he wanted to look at the diamond while mm-hmm. they were in the vault and realized that there, and he had the loop 
Yeah. Yeah. He brought that with him and he studied, he took a gemology course on the plane <laughs> over, you know, you could see your eye going, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's more to this guy than the intersect. So yeah. we were reminded of that, mm -hmm. but that does not take the place. And that's great, but that doesn't take the place of knowing how to take down three ninjas when you're attacked from behind. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, th I, th I think we've pretty much covered that issue. Um, boy, what did you guys think about Summer Glau? <laughs> it's exactly the character I expected her to play. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and Jeff and Lester handled it exactly the way I expected <laughs> them to. <laughs> yeah. uh, I loved when Morgan asked her which one she thought was the psychotic one. And he's like, you know what? It didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one answer is the same as the other. So, yeah. You know, I love when Summer Glau um, plays those those roles, the the tough chick role. I, um, you know, I loved her in Serenity. I I loved her in Sarah Connor, just mm. for that. I think she could bring that so well. Um, I, you know, I didn't like her character much on the forty four hundred. <laughs> oh yeah, well, she well, certainly showed her acting flexibility. The, she does she does and i don't maybe i don't know maybe i just she was in the way i <laughs> at the time i just kind of felt like oh, i just don't have time for you but uh -huh. i like her in roles like these where she's 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 bad mm -hmm. you know she's um tough she's mm -hmm. and she was even more she was precise mm -hmm. in in chuck i think because well, she's a spy so she had to be. So I really liked it. I loved watching her. You know, I was all excited. <laughs> uh -huh. And I liked that her part of the plot actually moved something forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jeff and Lester are really suspicious. Yeah, you heard them say, "Why do all of the why are all the new employees named Greta?" And you know, why does she keep disappearing? Mm -hmm. And you know, why is why does she have these skills? And they had to think fast. You know, um, Casey had to think fast to extricate her from the situation and mm -hmm. accuse her of being a thief. And for now, I think they're satisfied with that. But if there's another Greta, yeah, they're going to get suspicious again. Yeah. Which which makes you yeah. wonder, is, is this Greta something that, that they're going to keep up to the whole season? I think so. Hmm. I think so. Yeah. It's not in every single episode, because as, as we've seen, it's not always appropriate. But mm -hmm. I think they are going to keep it up. Yeah. Um. Well, let's hope they have more like Isaiah Mustafa. Yeah. He was just and the, Summer Glow. Yeah, and Summer Glow. Yeah, she yeah. was. She Those was great. But I, I know people have been asking for more male Gretas. Yes, we could use some more male Gretas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Like I don't know Augie from Covert Affairs. Like oh, Augie from Covert, Covert Affairs. <laughs> Absolutely, he'd be an awesome Greta. <laughs> or um, what's his name from Eureka? The tech guy from Eureka. Yeah, he, he, he totally he, blanking on his name. Um, the one that did the Fargo. crossover. Yeah. Yes, Fargo. Fargo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bring him yeah, on. Yeah, he'd, he'd be a good Greta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Gus from Psych, <laughs> and then he could scream and run like a girl. <laughs> yeah, done. <laughs> Liz's son loves that. Uh huh. Gus oh. is his favorite character. Yeah. And she's told him this. It's because he screams and runs like a girl. <laughs> Delay Hill thought was pretty funny. Yeah. No, I did we... want to mention that mm -hmm. in that we had that sequence where Chuck is being tested by the government scientists. Mm -hmm. And we got 31 days passed right there. Mm -hmm. While while um Sarah without trying to track down Mama Bartowski and poor Casey was stuck in the stuck with Chuck. Mm -hmm. But there's been some questions about timelines and how could the baby awesome be ready by February sweets, mm -hmm. you know, and how are we going to, and you know, the, the Chris, the Thanksgiving, how are we going to align that? There are people that keep track of this stuff mm -hmm. and they do it on the forum. So if you're interested, stop by, but <laughs> we, we just made up a month right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. Now it Clever. was, it was just a tiny, tiny line, but somebody mentioned on Twitter, and I, I thought it was worth uh, um, bringing up again when uh, the, oh, what was his name? Rye mm -hmm. um, broke into Chuck and Sarah's place. And Sarah said, what are you doing in our 
house. House. Yes. And I like that. I yeah. mean, it was it was a, a throwaway line, but I thought it was really significant. Ownership. Yeah. Absolutely. Owning not I'm, not, I'm not talking about ownership of the house. I'm talking about owning the relationship. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I did too. Yeah. So, uh, not not a whole lot else to discuss in this episode. Well, Chuck's been captured by yeah. Richard Chamberlain. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, actually, that's quite interesting. I think this is the first time we've had a part one, part two, like other than season finales. Mm -hmm. um, have we have we ever had such a cliffhanger at the end of just a regular season episode? Well, in season three, we had when Austin was kidnapped. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But they kind of spoiled that in the preview for the next episode. So. Yeah, <laughs> didn't really count. I think mm -hmm. any fears were alleviated, and of course, I mean, the show is called Chuck, so. Mm. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Like <laughs> but it's giving us the opportunity for what looks like an intense Sarah episode. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the coming next week was Woo. pretty significant. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be some pretty intense uh, physical going on there for for Yvonne. Yeah. Yeah. Gee, I'd love to I'd love to ask her about that episode, too. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hey, let's let's work on it. Maybe we can get an interview about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Ask her about what went into preparing for that. And yeah, we've got photos from the episode up on ChuckTV.net already, and there's not a single one with Chuck in them, which had a lot of people going, "Oh my gosh, what's going on?" But it's all Sarah. Mm -hmm. Sarah focused, and then um, you know Casey and Morgan, who as we saw at the end of this episode, agreed to go off on a mission with her to mm -hmm. rescue Chuck. So. Which was nice. It was nice to see the team ish. <laughs> I mean, they will be back together. Yeah. They're working together for a common goal to get Chuck. And but, remind and me again, is is next week episode ten? Nine. Oh nine, okay. Because I was just thinking, I know I that Zachary Levi directed episode ten. Yeah. Uh, some people were suggesting that maybe he was light in episode nine so he could prep for ten. Mm hmm I don't know. It works for the story, so Yeah. More for that. Yeah. Well, I know. Uh, I mean, definitely some of the fans' favorite scenes are when Sarah to gets to kick some butt. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> getting a whole episode of that should be pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of the team, we got to see Casey actually voice that he wants this team to stay together. Mm -hmm. That he was trying to prepare himself for the eventuality that he's going to be sent back to Afghanistan or Iraq because the team had been disbanded and that without Chuck, there was no team. And I thought that was significant. And it also is significant because Alex knows what her dad does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gray, you were asking what the title for next week's episode was. Oh, what the title was. for next week's episode was. Uh, next week is Chuck versus phase three. Phase three. Interesting. Yeah. There's been a lot of speculation about what phase three could be. Yeah. Well, can't wait to see that. And, uh, now, next week is the 22nd, and we get one more on the 29th, mm -hmm. and then after that, we're... Off till it. January. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, at least we get one on the 29th, uh, which yeah. is my birthday. Aww. Oh. The present we'll have to wear party hats. <laughs> I think so. Yep. Definitely, definitely. So, uh, I guess we can roll into thanking our sponsors. And now we want to thank our sponsors, ielabs.com, makers of award-winning Action Blue AVCHD conversion software, which offers full HD videos on regular DVD discs. It even works with HD clips with, from the newest iPhone 4. You can get your free trial of the software at ielabs.com. We also want to thank moviemorons.com for supporting Check versus the podcast. Movie Morons is a podcast all about film, so if you are inclined to find out what movies you should be watching this fall, check out MovieMorons.com. And SyrianJunkies.de, we want to thank them for supporting us as well. Hello, this is Christina Caramel from Serien Junkies TV. Are you addicted to TV shows? Be our guests and learn the latest news and reflections on what's going on in the world of TV series. Well, our show is in German, but maybe you want to drop in anyway? Then visit www.serienjunkies.de and watch out for our video podcast. See you. And we're back. 
And so we we do want to remind you that there are plenty of ways that you can support the podcast. Check out chuckpodcast.com to find out more about how you can. One really great way is to make sure to watch the podcast online uh, rather than um, on iTunes. Go to blip.tv or watch it at chucktv.net and we get just a tiny little kickback um, when you do that. And it's free to you, so that's pretty cool. Um, Also, I do want to mention the TV Writer Podcast this week featured Dan McDermott. Uh, He's the co-executive producer and writer for Human Target, which is premiering its second season this week. And also, interestingly, for Chuck fans, he was the writer of Eagle Eye, which, if you like spy stuff, that's uh, um, a great action movie that was out a couple years ago. So I urge you to check out that podcast at tvwriterpodcast.com. And remember, if you have any questions or comments to share, please email us at mail at chuckpodcast.com. Be sure to join us on chucktv.net on Monday, November 22nd at 8, 7 central for the live chat during the new episode of Chuck. Be there or be trapezoid. (laughs) I like that one. Cool. And we don't want to be trapezoid. (laughs) Anyway, uh, so if you don't want to hear spoilers, you know what to do. If you do want to hear spoilers, you also know what to do. So if you're signing off now because of not wanting spoilers, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. And we're back. Mel, what have you got for us? Well, we've got the official synopsis for episode 410, Chuck vs. The Leftovers. That airs November 28th, which is the Monday after Thanksgiving. Uh, Leftovers, get it? (laughs) And the the synopsis says, Chuck faces a high-stakes holiday when unexpected guests arrive for a Thanksgiving leftovers dinner. Monet Mazur, Linda Hamilton, and Timothy Dalton guest star. They're back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's the day after Thanksgiving, and Chuck faces the most awkward of family reunions when his mom comes over for dinner along with the dangerous Alexei Volkov. Back at the Buy More... Morgan deals with the busiest shopping day of the year as Jeff and Lester hatch their latest scheme. Yvonne Strahovski, <laughs> Sarah Lancaster, Ryan McPartland, Adam Baldwin, and Mark Christopher Lawrence also star. Oh, no. Oh, that sounds <laughs> like a lot of fun. The first I've heard of Monet Mazur um, guest starring. Mm-hmm. So I suspect that she's the Greta for that episode. Mm-hmm. But I haven't heard for sure. Yeah. But yeah, it's another Black Friday. Yeah. Pineapple! Um... Oh, that was one of my favorite moments of the entire series. <laughs> oh, I'm scared. Yeah. Well, episode 413 is titled Chuck versus Push the Push Mix. Probably airing first week of February sweeps. Baby awesome time, maybe? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> a mix oh. a music mix for the push. I just got oh, it. My goodness. <laughs> Oh, Isn't that boy. totally a Devin thing to do? That is a Devin <laughs> thing to do. I'm doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we've got some awesome Chuck and some fun Chuck coming, and I can't wait to see it. Right. But uh, for now, we're gonna leave you, and we'll be back next week. So, have a great Chuck week. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye bye.